It's every climber's worst nightmare. Falling out of control. Something goes wrong, it goes wrong big. 100 feet down to almost certain death. When you fall 100 feet, you have a 100% chance that you're gonna die. Great. He's a mass of shattered bones and pooling blood. We're four miles in the backcountry. Nobody knows we're here. It's an epic life and death battle. Craig DiMartino's fight to survive. Rock climbing is a sport that puts fear to good use. Fear brings focus. For avid climbers, clearing their minds of distractions is a life-saving imperative. The risks and the rewards are tremendous. Scaling a thousand feet brings an unparalleled sense of freedom and personal accomplishment, and the views aren't half bad either. I went to a bachelor party of a really good friend of mine, and he said, look, instead of going to a strip bar, we're gonna go to uh, this rock climbing place outside and just give it a go. Growing up in Eastern Pennsylvania, the outdoors was a big part of Craig DiMartino's boyhood. But Craig had never tried rock climbing. Kind of thought I was afraid of heights and I wasn't sure about that. And so when I tied in that very first time, I had this nervousness, but this anticipation of this is something cool. I want to see what this is about. And it immediately just, it resonated with my soul from that very first day. Before long, Craig was climbing constantly. Climbing put Craig in a position to explore his other passion, photography. You're in these weird areas where not a lot of people can be, so you start taking pictures and those two things integrate really well. After a few years of scaling the scrappy cliffs and crags of eastern Pennsylvania, Craig felt ready for bigger challenges and grander vistas. I packed my stuff up, moved to Colorado so that I could climb more and just be in the mountains. In Fort Collins, Craig met Cindy and the two hit it off. I love being outside with my friends and my family and I love the movement and challenge that climbing presents for me. We actually just started climbing together. And he was a really safe and reliable partner. A reliable partner is as critical to a safe climb as the right shoes, the right rope, and the rack of cams, nuts, and carabiners that climbers carry. I was actually afraid to ask her out. I thought, man, if it doesn't work out, I'm gonna lose a really good climbing partner. 18 months later, Craig and Cindy married. In a couple years, they had two children. Craig was working as a staff photographer for a Colorado publisher, while Cindy studied for a degree in wildlife biology. And they both climbed as much as they could with each other and with friends. On July 21st, 2002, Craig and his good friend Steve met up for a day of climbing in the Rocky Mountain National Park. We're gonna go up to Drake Monastery, do some sport climbing. We're gonna go up to Estes. There's this fun route I know called White Man. Okay. They set their sights on a particular thousand foot high granite egg called Sundance Buttress. Steve and I decided that I would go first, I would lead the climb. That's it? Yeah, finally. And so I'm gonna put the gear in. Climbs are rated on a scale of difficulty called the Yosemite Decimal System. This route is 511C. I'll know when I'm on it. So it has a difficulty rating, and then it has a rating for putting gear in. It's a 511C, but then it's an R, which means it's a very serious climb, which means it's, it's hard to put gear into. You're going to have to really look around. The old days, they used to pound pitons in. Now we use cams. They cam against the rock, and so the rope is running into these devices as you're going up the rock. Knowing where to place the cams is critical. A climber must judge the distance up against the length of rope out. If he climbs 10 feet above the cam and he falls, it will be 20 feet down. If I fall 20 feet, now you have to assess, what am I gonna hit? Is that piece gonna stay in the rock? If it pulls, where am I gonna go to? Craig began his zigzag across the rock. The granite face was fairly smooth, with only a few narrow cracks and folds for wedging in the small safety gear. 
This climb, for probably 50 feet, was all small gear. Climbers don't like small gear. We like big gear. Small gear tends to pull out. Craig headed toward the first anchor bolt, a steel pin at nearly 100 feet. Getting to that safe spot required a tricky maneuver called a traverse. When you traverse, you always run that risk of doing a pendulum. When you swing from this point, you're going to hit wherever you left. Steve is down below, holding on to the safety rope tied into Craig's harness. Once I was at the anchor, you get that, ah, OK, I'm still alive and happy. Craig clipped the harness into the anchor bolt. I'm at this anchor that is 100 feet off the ground, basically a 10-story office building. Off the leg. OK, nice job. Lays off. The climber's sight line was blocked by the cliff. Now I'm safe. I'm clipped into the rock. The route is over for me, and I'm ready to be lowered to the ground. Craig shouted down to Steve. Oh, you. OK. I unclipped my harness and just sat back. The rope was unsecured. I am really picking up a lot of speed. No. Craig hits a tree that stands him upright. I'm going the whole way. He's plowed into the ground at about 50 miles per hour. In the lingo of climbers, Craig has just cratered. I couldn't get my head around the fact that I was on the ground. And not that I was hurt, but just that I was on the ground where I shouldn't be. I should be you know, 100 feet in the air, and then suddenly the pain hit like a, like a freight train. Steve rushed over to find his friend in a pool of blood. Stay with me, Craig. You're going to be OK. Let me support your hand a little bit. Shattered bones sticking out from all over his legs. You're going to be OK, Craig. Back. Steve can't tell how badly Craig is hurt, but he does know Craig will be facing the fight of his life to survive. Climber Craig DiMartino was 100 feet up the granite face of a Colorado cliff. Then, in the blink of an eye, he crashed to the ground. He can't move his head or sit up or see the pool of blood growing around him. I wasn't thinking about death at that moment. I was thinking about this amazing fear I had of not having any control over the situation as it was happening. Craig! Craig's climbing buddy, Steve, had scrambled over the loose boulders to find Craig conscious, You're gonna be okay, buddy. but in a mangled heap. Steve is looking at this pile. What the heck just happened? Hang in there, buddy. How do you even begin to deal with this? He doesn't know that my back's broken or my neck is broken. Hey, stay with me. You're going to be okay. But he knows you can't fall 100 feet and not damage your insides. No! Neither are clear about why Craig fell. Perhaps a miscommunication or mistaken assumption. In any case, Steve knew the priority. We're going to slow the bleeding on this. Was now to stop the bleeding. You with me, Craig? Stay with me, buddy. He put a tourniquet on my right leg to kind of slow the bleeding. We're four miles in the back country. Nobody knows we're here. What do we do? I'm going to run to Estes and get help, OK? I'll be right back. Steve dug into his climbing bag for his cell phone. We're next to a thousand foot granite cliff in the backcountry. He not only gets a cell signal, dials 911. My buddy fell to the ground from white man we're climbing Sundance Buttress. Gets pushed right through to Rocky Mountain Rescue. Yeah, Steve. Okay, we'll look for you on the trip. And the uh, guy who is on call there, Eric hey, Gabriel, they're coming, Craig. is not only the head of Rocky Mountain Rescue, he's a climber. As Eric made his way to Craig and Steve, he alerted other rescue team members to join him. Hey, it's Eric Gabriel. Now we have a fallen climber at the bottom of the Sundance Buttress. I'm on the way up flagging the route. I had Eric at my side probably within 40 minutes of hitting the ground, which is unheard of in the backcountry. Paramedic. Yeah, here, OK. What happened? Check you out here and see if you're anywhere else, OK? You let me know. There is a quote in climbing that if you fall 10 feet, you have a 10% chance of dying. If you fall 20 feet, you have a 20% chance of dying. I just came 100 feet, so you can do the math. Steve and Eric knew that Craig's situation was worse than Craig thought. Hey. You want us to call your wife? Eric asked me if I wanted him to call my wife, Cindy. I thought that was a bad idea. I just thought, OK, I don't want her to worry. But then shortly after that, you sure you don't want us to call your wife? I, I must be hurt bad. OK. 
Maybe I should call Cindy. Cindy? Hello. It's Steve. Oh, hi, Steve. Steve said that Craig had taken a fall. What happened? And that he had broken his ankles. But no, he's going to be OK. And I thought that he had just fallen right. to the end of the rope and maybe hit his feet on the, you know, on the face. I'm on my way. So I didn't know that Craig had actually hit the ground. And I didn't go beyond that in my head. I just wanted to get there and see for myself. Eric did his best to stabilize Craig's injuries and packaged him for a difficult, bumpy rescue. It'll be okay, Craig. Called a carryout. The rescue team prepared an elaborate system of ropes and pulleys to move Craig down the mountain quickly and safely. When I first saw Craig, I didn't know how badly injured he was. Eric pretty much said to me, you know, you can talk to Craig, but make it quick. I went up to Craig and I said, you know, I love you and I'm right here, but I'm gonna step out of the way because I want these guys to get you out of here. She's looking at me and realizing my husband can die. And I'm looking at her and that suddenly became very clear that that, that I'm not gonna get up, that I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna walk away from it. This is gonna maybe kill me. This is really serious, and, and I don't know how this will end. It took the rescue team nearly five hours to bring Craig to a clearing in the valley. From there, they loaded him aboard a waiting helicopter and flew him to the hospital in Fort Collins. I'm Cindy DiMartino, I'm looking for my husband, Craig. Craig was in surgery, and they brought in a grief counselor. And I thought to myself, why is there a grief counselor here? You know, I don't need a grief counselor. I still wasn't really aware of how seriously injured Craig was. Later in the evening, when we were waiting for Craig to come out of surgery, his neurosurgeon came out. He said, you know, we really just need to see how Craig makes it through the hour. The hour? He, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't expecting Craig to make it. To hear Craig might die is a really difficult thing to hear as a spouse. Craig's neck was broken clean through. Broken ribs punctured his lung. His back was broken, and pieces of his shattered vertebra lodged in his spinal canal. He had a large hematoma in his chest and contusions on his kidneys, liver, and heart. With bolts, rods, and pins, surgeons do what they can. His feet and ankles were shattered. They moved me to intensive care, put me on a ventilator because I couldn't breathe on my own. And my wife, Cindy, ended up sitting with me as I was unconscious for the entire night just to see if I was going to live through the night. July 22, 2002. Cindy DiMartino waited in a Fort Collins hospital for word about her husband, Craig. Just 24 hours earlier, he had been scaling a thousand foot granite cliff. Now, after a long night in surgery, he was fighting for his life. I spoke to his surgeon and he said, well, he made it through the night, but we really didn't know what that was gonna look like. We didn't know if he was gonna be a paraplegic or if he was gonna be a double amputee. We just knew that he survived the night. As days stretched into weeks, Craig's condition stabilized. Cindy was there all the time. And I would ask, you know, what's going on with my feet? What's going on with my back? What's going on with my neck? And what I didn't realize was they're being vague on purpose. What they're telling Cindy is, you know, he's, he's probably going to be a paraplegic, probably a quadriplegic, one of the two. His spine was shattered. He doesn't have any movement. Right after Craig's accident in the weeks following was a very scary time. What's his life gonna look like? What's his reaction gonna be? How are we gonna handle this? And then how are we gonna provide for our family financially? Our kids were really young. You get to see your daddy? Is this Is that fun? Look at him taking Hi, a picture. Do you guys get to visit your dad every day? That's so much fun, huh? Craig's feet had been shattered and now rebuilt with pins and screws, but there was no way to be sure if he would walk again until he started physical therapy. So he began what climbers call a suffer fest. I've got rods in my back. Your back is no. Plates, screws, every time you move, all this scar tissue's cracking and breaking. Mm. 
I got in this process. You wake up, you do physical therapy, you feel like you're gonna die. Uh, I don't even think soccer players can do that one. You're in this constant cycle of just horrific pain. You pass out, you eat dinner, you go to bed, and that's your whole world. You get to see me fall today, that'll be fun. How do I survive the pain that I'm in? Tired. Thank you. He knew that the only way that he was gonna do that was for him to sit down and do the work. Just going for it, just walking forward is insanely hard. You know, I gotta do it on crutches and it's just, it's just insanely hard. I hate that exercise. <laughs> Craig has an amazing positive attitude and he was able to look at himself and laugh. This is gonna make people think therapy's fun. Uh-huh, you keep smiling. I would sit in doctor's office when they were giving me these really bad reports and I would just start making jokes. Broken back thing has a lot of drawbacks that they don't talk to you about before you do it. So if you're thinking about it, that wouldn't do it. I could focus on the negative of it, but I'm gonna focus on the positive of it. Some days I would get there and he would say, hey, you know, I walked today. And then other days, you know, weren't as productive. So it was a slow process and it wasn't an easy process. This is Mr. No Feeling. Still not on the bottom though, huh? Uh -huh. My feet were still messed up and they're still talking to me about, you know, your right leg is not healing. That is very problematic. I developed a nerve disorder six months after the accident called reflective sympathetic dystrophy. And I remember this neurosurgeon telling me, you're probably gonna be in a wheelchair full time. Just so you know. It's just really hard to balance on it. And it kind of hurts. The nerve disorder caused excruciating pain in his right leg. And the fragments of bone in his right foot weren't knitting together well enough to ever provide a stable walk. It seemed like Craig was destined for a wheelchair. He didn't want to sit on the couch for the rest of his life. He wanted to be out taking pictures and doing his job and feeling like a person who's contributing to society. He wanted to live his life. A year and a half later, Craig went back into surgery, this time to surrender a limb to win back his life. I lay down and the next thing I know, I wake up, look down, and this side of the bed, there's foot sticking up, and on this side, it's flat. Okay, I've just stepped into a whole new world. That's not hurting your back, is it? No. Craig DiMartino fought hard to survive a near fatal climbing accident. No! He even gave up a leg in the hope of being able to once again pursue his passion. I fit you with a prosthesis, and the first prosthesis is extremely painful. You have to learn a new center of balance because your body is made so that it's perfectly in balance. Well, all of a sudden you cut a leg off, now you're out of balance. But a normal prosthetic foot just isn't designed for Craig's lifestyle. To figure what's best for him, Craig went to Joe Johnston of Quorum Prosthetics. It just, it does, it, it's one, exactly. It does it, it's just not. So how much are you gonna cut off of that? I'm probably gonna take about a half inch off both sides. Joe designed an effective walking foot. Everybody thinks carbon fiber is indestructible, but it's not. <laughs> and worked on early prototypes of a climbing model. Craig then called on the TRS company to build him a prosthetic foot crafted to endure the rigors of climbing, while Evolve developed a special climbing shoe. The man-made foot functioned well in the lab, but before it could prove its worth in a real climb, Craig himself needed to prove something first. His chance came on a camping trip as he helped his young daughter finish a climb. I was belaying Maya, and as I lowered her back to the ground, she just very innocently looked at me and said, Are you gonna climb? He was like, hmm. I don't know. You know, kind of put the seed in his mind, and he thought, yeah, I'm gonna climb this too. I was terrified. Every move was just pure, I'm gonna die. The rope's gonna explode, this cliff's gonna tip over. I mean, all these things are running through your head. And I get to the anchor, which was like what I had fallen from. The last thing I had seen at a climbing area was something very similar to that. And I'm looking at this anchor going, oh man, this is not where I wanna be. I just sat there and I wouldn't let go. You know, 10 minutes later, probably, I'm thinking to myself, well, it was nice to tie in again. It was nice to be moving again. And that process just repeated itself over the next year. 
Craig continued to rebuild his confidence and hone his skills with the prosthetic foot. Then in June of 2006, four years after his accident, Craig gets a remarkable invite from a legend in the world of climbers, Hans Florian. He said, well, look, why don't you come out to the valley, that's what climbers call Yosemite, and we'll climb El Cap together. And that's like going to play basketball with Michael Jordan. As an afterthought, he's like, and you should do it in a day because no APTs have done it in a day. And I was like, okay. El Cap, El Capitan a 3,100-foot vertical wall, and one of the longest rock climbs in North America. El Cap is the yardstick by which climbers measure themselves. I was thrilled that he wanted to do it, and I was thrilled that he was gonna have the opportunity to go try again. But then on the other hand, I was a little scared. To complete the climb in one day, Hans and Craig must start before sunrise. I was thinking, oh man, this might have been a mistake. But then once we started climbing and moving, you're, you're just doing the process and enjoying it. People who were disabled were looking at him going, who's this disabled guy who's climbing El Cap? When I completed that climb in 14 hours, that made me the first amputee to ever climb El Capitan in a day. Okay, so if we could do that, if I could finish that, what else, what else does this look like? Closest to you. I always felt like God had a plan in my life. All of a sudden, it was just very obvious that this plan was unfolding and, and I just had to kind of step through the doors that were open for me. For me, my attitude towards the accident has always been, it is a big defining piece of me, but it is not who I am and I don't ever want it to be. I don't ever want people to say, oh, yeah, you were in that really horrific accident, that's a bummer. I want them to look at it and go, oh, you were in that horrific accident and you moved on, you moved forward. <laughs>